Hello and welcome to Clarity Conversations. I'm joined by Ianad Burrell. Ianad is a 2020 candidate for the West Contra Costa School Board trustee seat, Area 4 of Richmond, California. Ianad's running on the platform of transformation in education that is student-centered and equitable. She's also the director of Glasshouse Communications, founding board member of iHealth Innovation, and an equity, inclusion, and diversity consultant. Thank you for joining me here on Clarity Conversations, Ianad. Thank you for having me, sis. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Hopefully this uh, smoke will clear up in the air in our area Ooh. here in California. Oh, yes. It's been so dramatic. Okay, so let's get to the conversation at hand. Thanks for joining me again. Please share with my audience your uh, Bay Area background. Absolutely. I am a native of San Francisco. Born and raised in San Francisco, grew up in the Bayview District, Bayview Hunters Point, did all my education in San Francisco from Lowell High School, then on to my undergrad work at San Francisco State, then on to my graduate work at Golden Gate University with a master's in healthcare administration and public administration. And now, super excited to be in a doctoral program. I have lived in Richmond for over 25 years, love Richmond. Whatever anybody has said, don't believe it. We are the hidden gem. We are the new, the next, and fill in the blank, as long as it's a good fill in the blank. Been here 25 years, love it to pieces. Definitely a diverse, diverse community. Glasshouse Communications, which is my PR firm, I started 12 years ago. And interestingly enough, all of my education, none of those, believe it or not, are in journalism or, or PR, any of that. They were in accounting and these other areas. But I have to say, there's something about the joy and talent and secret sauce of communication that I love. So I have loved Glass House. It is my thing. It's what I do. It's, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's everything. And we do equity, diversity, and inclusion facilitation and training. We do a lot of strategic communication around messaging. And you know, there's a lot of messaging that's happening right now that needs some finesse. It needs some something special to it. So that is that is kind of me in a nutshell for the most part. Love the family. I think I think we're up to five generations now that are still in the Bay Area. My brothers, my mom, my dad, cousins, nieces, nephews. It's just I'm just very grateful. And I just got married last year. So oh, <laughs> congratulations. I thought I saw something like that on social. Something a, a, a man in the picture. Right. Yes, yeah, so congratulations on that. You know. Thank you. So let me ask you, what prompted you to run for that uh, seat in area four for the uh, school board seat in particular, that trustee seat? Mm -hmm. Have you heard being comfortable with being uncomfortable? We've kind of heard that. Well, I have been uncomfortable being comfortable. That's the reverse. And what I mean by that, living in Richmond over 25 years, watching what's happening in education, just kind of watching it from afar, kind of watching, going to school board meetings, going to community meetings, and just watching and being saddened by a lot of the outcome, being very just drawn into everything that's going on, but I hadn't pushed myself to be a part of the conversation. And hence, now is the time. So after watching, unfortunately, the district has been underperforming from academically for a while. There, we have amazing students. They are brilliant, they are smart, they are willing, they wanna learn, they want to grow. But all the nuances of doing that have been challenging. So my impetus, my reason, my passion for Putting my, putting my name in the hat is from watching from afar. I've, being on the community conversations, being a part of task force and, and groups and things like that, but not close enough to the fire. And so this is my opportunity to share my time, talent, and treasure with students across the entire district, and I would be representing district or area, area four, to really be a part of close to the conversation around practices, policies, and programs that really allow them to flourish, to grow, and it's their fundamental right to have a very, an experience of education. So I'm looking forward. So, 
Thank you for your answer. I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. I'm really eager to get into this conversation because I myself have been involved in education, special education in particular. And uh, I'm very concerned about some things that I'm, I've seen over the years, the things that I'm seeing with all of the changes with you know, the new ways of educating our children. So what would you say, generally speaking, are your biggest concerns for children generally, just across the board, generally speaking, and then we'll get into your specifics uh, in Contra Costa County in particular. Generally speaking is curriculum and curriculum design that is too monolithic. It has to have many more legs, much more diversity. We cannot teach the same way across the board in education. We cannot teach every sixth grader the exact same way because just because they're all in the sixth grade, you, there are still nuances of how they learn that have to be threaded into how the curriculum is designed. So overall, when we think about all students, whether they're within this district or any, how is the curriculum design that meets the needs of students that where they are able to not only be met, those needs be met, but actually learn. So there's a difference, as you know, being in education between academic learning and academic achievement. When you have both that are failing or suffering, it's, it's a huge barrier. So the overall is how curriculum is designed and delivered to students. And then most definitely, we can't put all students in one category. So we have our students who are bilingual. We have those English language learn learners. We have those students who are disabled. All of those things are not monolithic. monolithic. They are very diverse. And what in particular uh, in the Contra Costa School District are you seeing that are real concerns for you? To What would be some of your immediate uh, works, things that you, see that you really want to get your hands on first? Around mental health and wellness and, the, and students. And what I mean by that, in this pandemic, we are experiencing in the distance learning sphere that not only before the pandemic was mental health and wellness an issue in terms of how much it is accessible to students and delivered to students. With the pandemic, we've had an increase in anxiety and I'm not saying, now let me be very specific. Everything I'm about to say is not specific to West Contra Costa so broadly. We've seen mental health and wellness that needs to be increased in service from depression, anxiety, being suicidal, not necessarily committing suicide, but being suicidal. So in this pandemic, this chasm, as I call it, has widened so much that if we don't grab it by the reins sooner than later, we're not only going to miss students, which is going to be devastating, we're gonna miss generations of opportunity of students who just didn't have a chance. And to put a little bit of that in perspective, and this will be related to Contra Costa, West Contra Costa Unified School District. In June or July is when we first heard that there were over 750 students in the district that never logged in a Chromebook starting in March. 750 students. We didn't, when I say we, the community or that information was not shared with us until June or July. What happened? Can you imagine? What happened? So we can't just give a Chromebook and say, oh, we're distance learning now. There's a whole dialogue, there's a training, there, there's a lot that has to happen in that transition that didn't happen. So top, top of mind, right off, the, right off the press, mental health and wellness for our students. So how, uh, and I, I understand what you're talking about. You know, when they talk about the digital divide, there's more going on. We're not just talking about neighborhoods or communities or families. We are actually talking about the connection between teacher and student, literally. So those connections that used to, well, I can't even say that they used to be because as we know, our children were going to school. They were in the classrooms and literally feeling ignored 
overlooked. Uh, you know, they weren't connecting with the teachers that way. So yes, the concern is even greater now. And I understand about that logging in, how are you planning to connect with the families of those children, the guardians, the uh, foster families, with those children? How are we going to actually make the connection? What are your plans for those relationships with parents and students? Keep it in mind that we, this happened overnight. The pandemic happened overnight. So the district, as many districts, are forced to not just pivot, reinvent overnight how this, how curriculum can be delivered. So now we're here. It's been a number of months. And also for the first time, Richmond is in areas. So prior to this election coming up November 3rd, it was the entire city, Richmond, El Sobrante, that individual candidates would run. Now we're in areas, which means, yes, I'm focused on area four, yet I still have to serve the district. So if I'm speaking to area four, one of, one of the things, and to back to, before I say that, about the connectivity. Some say, well, we just got a thousand hotspots. So now everybody has a hotspot. It's beyond a hotspot. Because when you think about it, while every household may have a hotspot, how many are living in that household that are connecting to that one hotspot and everybody's connecting at the same time? So the stories that I hear are, hey, you know, when something is stuck and it just twirls and twirls and you have that little... That loading, yeah. It just stays there because the connectivity mm -hmm. hasn't been kicked in. So yes, hotspots are out there, but it's beyond that. So that's an entire another conversation in terms of the households yeah. that have to have access. So in terms of where do we start? If I'm not having a conversation directly with those who are impacted, then I'm missing the mark. And what I mean by that, I'm not talking about going to a board me meeting every two weeks or every month yeah. and reporting out over whatever internet. I am actually taking intentional and targeted time to meet with. In this pandemic, it will not be face-to-face. -face. So, and that's another thing. Say it can't be face-to-face. -face. And I said, okay, let's get on a Zoom call. Well, I don't have, a, I don't have a, the connection. We have to figure out. So now what do we do? But I'm going to work on that. It is my goal to make sure that every parent, student, stakeholder, community leader in area four knows me personally. Personally, not our board member is Ian Odd Burrell and, and ABC. No, they have met me, they have seen me, seen me. We have had a conversation. They have a connection. Without me hearing directly from them and not listening to, okay, there's data that says this or data that says that. They will have to know me and I will have to know them. And that is the start of building trust, being a trusted messenger, being an intentional messenger and being a servant. This is public service, this is service for me. This comes, this is not even hard to do because it's innately part of just who I am. So to start, having those relationships. Okay, Ian, can you really meet every parent face-to-face? -face? If they're willing, available. If they're available, I'm available. So we have our parent groups that represent parents because those groups sometimes take the message back. We have community yeah. leaders that have groups. So it's really about them having a much more tangible and face-to-face -face relationship. And I'm going to do that. What about your relationship with those teachers and administrators who are sitting behind those doors, um, at, behind the screen or in front of the screen, you know, creating the, uh, cu the curriculum or the plans and, you know, having their, their LCAP meetings and everything will be done digitally. So what about your connections with them, with the teachers and administrators? Um, how do you plan to make it happen how do you plan to get those, your messages and uh, the, the, uh, relate those ideas and concerns for parents to those uh, district, uh, important persons in the district? Definitely, there is a whole conversation around the responsibility of a board member 
Some believe the board member is responsible for how that curriculum is, curriculum is designed. The board has interest and impact on policy, procedures, resolutions, and writing those. To take it further to say, your curriculum must be written this way is an entirely different, it's not under the purview. It's under the purview definitely of the leadership at the district. However, we are not separated from being a part of that conversation. Right. So how do we become right. a part of that conversation? Inserting yourselves as opposed to saying, you know, I know it's the responsibility of the staff and leaders at the district to write the curriculum and be a part of delivery and leave it there. Or for me, and because I understand the value of education, which is why I'm still going, because I enjoy education and I know what it can, what it can bring, it infuses me much more to want to share that experience with, I don't have to know every student, I just know the, what it does for a community, what it does for an economy, just overall. So it is my intention to not have this barrier between, okay, teachers, you are the experts, you the curriculum design individuals, you are those, and deliver. Because at the end of the next day, when those results, those academic learning and achievement results come in, guess who's going to be looked at as responsible for that? Leadership from the board and leadership from the, the leadership in the district. So I am going to make sure that I am inserted as opportunity presents itself, and I don't see any barriers to that, to be a part of that conversation. Because if it's not approached through an equity, diversity, and inclusive lens, if every single time you write a curriculum, every single time you write a program, if you are not writing it through that lens, you're missing hundreds and hundreds of students. And that is not only what I've studied and and believe in, but it's what I know. I know it from a, so how, do, how will I do that in terms of what you've asked, connecting? I'm inserting myself with, through the proper, when I say inserting, through the proper channels, through the proper ways, but I'm not going to separate myself. Our teachers are huge, they're important. They are the instructors. They are critical, just like every other staff member as well. One of the things that the district, West Country Council Unified School District, started with this new semester is what they call Wellness Fridays. So every Friday is a time for checking in with the students. Do you have, did you pick up your food? What other resources do you need? What is any other wellness? Like it's called Wellness Fridays. I thought that was great. That was out of screaming for the need to just have a conversation because sometimes five days of instruction over the computer without an actual connection beyond <laughs> academics can take us. Yeah, take you're us right about that. Yeah. I have a 15 year old who um, is a sophomore in high school now. And uh, he just uh, did a, a whole interview with me about socializing with his friends. We talked about ideas and ways to socialize with his friends. Uh, do you have any plans to help children become more social? You know, that seems to be the missing component in this whole uh, digital connection uh, through learning and all. It's great, but Having PE uh, <laughs> is impossible. I've, I've tried to actually make him work out in the hallway here at home. <laughs> and then uh, connecting with his friends, you know, like they would normally at lunchtime or after school for a little social or downtime. What about that? And how do, how do, you, how do you see it um, happening for children under your watch? Yes, and everything goes, will first go back to whatever health orders are in place through our county and then of course through our, and then it trickles down from the governor and it comes on down. But I also know while I haven't written this opportunity or written this program, there's something about the outdoors that's so therapeutic that just the fresh air, it, whether you're doing nothing or whether you're just walking, 
is actually therapeutic. I'm hoping to recommend, to suggest, to be able to show how, whether we're taking the trails, where we're doing walking in certain parks, whether we are in social distance, with masks, all of those things. But without agenda, and what I mean by that is allowing it to flow. So to really have to sit back and say, okay, we're about to write something, an outdoor program that's going to have A, B, C, and D. How about meet me at ABC Park, ABC Trail, have your mask, and let's just go. And without the anxiety and figuring it out, because kids will find ways, just give them the space and room to fulfill what they need once given the opportunity of space. Now, this is not anything that I've written and designed. This is not anything that I've submitted. I just know the outdoors and the oxygen, the air does something for, and then the social, the social part. So how are you talking about including that in the, um, the day of instruction or outside of the day of instruction? Because they are getting out at 1230 in the afternoon now for most districts? I'm thinking, and I don't, don't know for sure, how can the community leaders or commu stakeholders become a part of that? So I don't know if it's about having teachers then institute that or be over that. I have no idea mm -hmm. that's something that is district. I love the idea. Yes. So I love that. you have an opportunity now for community leaders who have programs mm -hmm. who are in the business of designing programs for after school to be a part of that. It allows for new groups to be at the table, literally at the table because they are, and you're kind of away from, not that you're getting away from the teacher or away from the instructor, but it allows the instructor and the teacher now to have some time, the students to have some time with a new group. And what can we, what can we create? You can imagine even Oh my God, I just, this just popped in. Your, your energy is coming through. This just popped in <laughs> for a second. Can you imagine an outdoor classroom? Or, oh, <laughs> by the, I'm all excited. I'm so excited the, here. Actually, by the way, there is a school in Berkeley and it's, I think they are, well, we don't have to worry about where they're, but they have, they have taken the school, it's outdoors. So for 10 months, their school is in the street. In oh, 10 great. Oh, I was, great. Mm -hmm. I was in I've Well, not great in these conditions, but right. I know I'm just saying they're being just, innovative. Yeah. But I thought an outdoor musical, when I say musical, bring whatever it is you play, don't play, if you're dancing, if you're whatever, and it's just completely free flowing. As Stevie Wonder would say, <laughs> music connects every language, every demographic, every ethnicity. It's the blend of, of so many things, it's music. And just allow that to, to flow. Please, I have to figure out where we're gonna get the instruments and things like that. Mm -hmm. but that well, speaking of uh, resources and all of that, it, it, you know, I was thinking about the importance of really being able to fund new and innovative ideas like that. Um, how do you feel about redirecting city uh, funding from the police department or from the Department of Health into a program like that? And will you be willing to fight for something like that? I'm willing to fight for new and innovative funding. What I mean by that, I know you're the newswoman and this is not new to you, but it may be new to some of our, some, someone who's watching. Salesforce, along with other tech companies, but I'm just going to take Salesforce, for instance, has just given $9 million to San Francisco Unified School District, $9 million to OUSD Oakland Unified School District. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. What about us? What right. about us? But That's right. if, if you're not having the conversations, if you're not creating the partnerships and the relationships, it's hard to just turn around one day and you've never had a conversation with Salesforce, say, hey, what about... Where I come in is the very new, innovative, fresh ideas with legs, meaning I have relationships with all of those tech companies and I've had them for a long, well, at least six or seven years. Starting the conversation right now, the young woman who's over philanthropy at Salesforce is an alumni. We both went to Lowell High School. She's my friend. 
it's it's like okay but you have to start the relationships and the conversations you cannot just overnight those need to start now so i am for letting new we got twitter facebook salesforce pandora you name it they're all still in well they're empty buildings right now many of them but their their money is still there there's still an opportunity so that's the kind of funding and innovation of pulling in new resources you have to pull in new partners yeah yeah speaking of partners what about your board members how do you plan to work with board members what are some of your strategies to you know to get them to to join you or to come on board on on your your new and innovative new uh, bullet train <laughs> so to speak well, I, one of the things I'm just so grateful for, I really, really, really am. I can't recall much of any confronta confrontation that I've had. I've been on Arts and Commission for eight years now. Been on in, many boards. In, in Contra Costa County? Contra Costa County Arts Wonderful. and Culture Commission for eight years. I was the chair last year. Currently, right now, health uh, Healthy Richmond, the communications chair for the past couple of years. Self STEM board member, which is an organization that does trait mentoring in STEM for girls. Currently been a, been a board member on the National Public Relations Society of America, Diversity and Inclusion Committee for over seven years. And I don't, I don't know, I know conflict can exist, I just know, as I often say, the real Olivia Pope, that would be me in a lot of ways, I like to say, <laughs> that I find ways of listening, understanding, and then allowing for dialogue, as opposed to, I'm not interested in that. You're not hearing it my way. It has to go my way. When you listen, and there's, two, there's a difference between hearing and listening, quite different. You got to listen to find a way to come on board. I'm looking at the potential new board members who, may, who, are, who will be elected. There are five seats. Of the five seats, one board member who is running unopposed, so he'll be remaining in his seat. So that's four, potentially four new board members. Three of the members are not running again. And there's just one other who is running again. So potentially, there could be four new board members out of five. That's a that's huge. Yeah, yeah, so sure. we're talking about even if even if it's three new board members out of five. So we're talking about new, fresh, and ready to roll opportunities in terms of collaborating. So how would I get how would I get other board members to we're gonna work this out? Because at the end of the day, if what we're not doing is not student centered, if it's centered in any kind of way. We're missing the mark. We're definitely missing the mark. Student centered all the way. And, and so back to that question about um, education funding, are you looking at really working on redirecting some funding from the police departments and sheriff's departments like many of the surrounding cities, San Francisco, Vallejo, they're all working toward redirecting law enforcement funding to to allow more funding for education it's just been missing mm -hmm. what my understanding first first to answer the question as a board member it is not under my purview it is not something that would come to our table for a vote there has recently been a vote to remove all sros off all the campuses in west country Costa unified school district that was done maybe three months ago so there are no sros on campus now and that's money that has been kind of placed somewhere and it they was, are not there so the money was placed according to a resolution towards the african-american students directly for their achievement for their learning for their programming so according to the resolution that was signed it's now, it was over a million dollars or so, that's now directed specifically for the African-American students within the district. And they are the majority in the district. Is that still correct? Or? 
I know there are a, it's a large amount. I would have to double check numbers if they are the largest population throughout the district. I would have to double check those numbers. But so how, I'm sorry, keep going. Keep going. No, go ahead. Sorry. So, so uh, because, and that's why I brought it up, because I have connected with some of the folks, you know, working on that. And I was really just trying to get clear about your position on that and, and, and how you felt about trying to get your hands on some of that funding to help you with your efforts. So as board members, we have no purview or vote in funds coming out of the police department into any other place. City, city council, city, of, those are the individuals who are making that decision and making that vote. Mm -hmm. And it's my understanding, not that I have all the facts, that whatever might happen, if funds are removed or diverted, would go into community programs and community education programs and other programs. So the community is invested in. But as a board member, a school board member, we have no vote or authority over, we're going to vote against it or for it or any of that. That's not under our purview or responsibility. So Ian, what would you say the responsibility is of the trustee? Absolutely. And thank you for that question, because there's often, I won't say confusion, but just not understanding of what what a school board member does, what is their responsibility? They only have, first of all, they only have one employee and that's the superintendent. So who they monitor, supervise, look after, all of that is the superintendent of the district. Everything that falls under the superintendent is his or her responsibility, but it's the board member's responsibility. That is the only employee that they have. The board, the school board member also establishes the vision and the goals of the district, that's important. So they establish those policies and procedures. That can be a big deal. Vision and goals, some big visions, some big goals, but the school board members are responsible for that. They also have to be aware of policies, laws that can affect the district. They need to be on top of what's going on nationally, throughout California, locally, that can impact the school in any kind of way, whether it's from a legal perspective, students, any of those things, they have to be aware. They also, when I say responsible for the superintendent, back to that, they evaluate the superintendent. So there's an evaluation. There's actually a performance. They need to be having performance evaluations with milestones. It's one thing to say, we're going to have this, this evaluation, but it needs to be with milestones. It needs to be with deliverables. And a lot of, lot of important areas, and this is one of them as well, budget. They are responsible for maintaining, analyzing, dissecting that budget and need to know the ins and outs of the budget. Right now, unfortunately, our district is at a deficit, close to $50 million deficit right now in the red. How did we get there? How did that happen? understanding and I always say how do we get here because you don't want to repeat the very things and lastly they serve as leaders and representatives of the community and advocates they are we are servants and I'm saying we as I'm being optimistic that the community parents and and students and everyone will see the leadership quality that I have my intentionality about being student-centered, my focus on having equity, and want that for the district. So board members are servants for the community, for parents, for, for students, for stakeholders. They have to, that, have, to have that connection, so. And uh, uh, lastly, are uh, you willing to invite some of your constituents uh, to the open school board meetings? And if so, share uh, the dates and times of the next board meeting and whether or not you'll be there, how they can reach out to you and connect with you. 6.30 today is the next, <laughs> is our next, is our next board, yeah. our next, the West Contra, Contra Unified, West Contra Costa Unified School District Board meeting. The next one is today at 6.30. It is usually bi-weekly, every other. So this is the, 
the ninth is the second, every second and fourth Wednesday online, but please reach out to me. I will send you the link. Sometimes it's a little difficult to find the link on the district's website. My email address is Ianad, which is Y-A-N-A-D at Ianad Burrell for the number four, WCCUSD.com. If you reach out to me, it is a Zoom call. It's a Zoom meeting, but there are opportunities for public comment on every area of the agenda. And I often have something to say about stuff on the agenda because it's, it's something that I'm interested in and I wanna share. So absolutely, if you're interested in, and anybody can be a part of it on Zoom, but definitely if you email me, ianod at ianodburrell for wccusd.com, I will send you all the information about the meetings. And are they still holding the live television broadcast uh, of those meetings as well, Ianod? No, not through CCTV any longer, no. So they are Zoom calls. Okay. They are both, and they're on Facebook Live at the same time. Oh, yeah. like, mm -hmm. So yeah. you can go to the West Country College Unified School District Facebook page where it's streaming live or log in by Zoom where you will see it. It's just, it, it, it's not, of course, you're just watching this more like webinar style. Great, great. Well, thank you for joining me today here, Ianad. Thank you so much. I've been joined, everyone, by Ina Burrell. She is the 2020 candidate for the West Contra Costa School Board trustee seat, Area 4 of Richmond, California. Thank you again for joining me. And remember to all all of you out there, please subscribe to Clarity Media on YouTube and to the Bay Area Mental Health Hour. Uh, I am Alicia Mayo, the founder of Clarity Media, and I invite all of you to tune in, check out some of the episodes there, and look for this episode of Clarity Conversations being rebroadcast on my YouTube channel as well. Again, for everyone here at Clarity Media, I'm Alicia Mayo. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a great day. Thank you. Uh -huh. Black woman owned Clarity Media.